in this impromptu gathering. Uh, thank you all for turning out here in support of Serkan Heritage. Um, this is all really important. We're really, really happy to have you know this tonight, Ben Copeland, who is a legend. And we also have among us many other people who have played significant roles in the sport and in the culture of surfing. And uh, of course, that's why we're all here tonight. So, um, like I said, I had not counted on having to speak tonight. Um, ostensibly, we were here to celebrate Bing, Bing surfboards, the legends of, you know, of Bing. And um, we were, you know, obviously, going to sell a few books, if we could, and uh, being and I were in the side of it. Um, really, what we're doing it on a Saturday night, we're just having a good time with surfers. You know, that's glorious too. So, um, without further ado, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about this book. Uh, Bing Surfboards, 50 Years of Craftsmanship and Innovation. <coughs> And for me as an author, it was uh, kind of a cool thing because I've just written a book on Del Belzey. And Bing, of course, got his start in Belzey's workshop as a 13 or 14 year old kid sweeping up. <coughs> and, and, excuse me, I'm getting over a call here. And doing um, things that, you know, drummers get to do, run errands, get sandwiches, that kind of thing. That's how Bing got his start in the surfboard building industry. <coughs> and he um, went on to create, you know, a very successful surfboard label. It was my pleasure to work with him, <coughs> get all of his stories, write the book, produce it. And the person that I was really most indebted to in there was Tom Moss, great photographer, <coughs> and a collector of big surfboards, many of which are on display here tonight. Tom took all the surfboard pictures of the book, all the fin photos, and uh, he's not much into public speaking, but he has a great story about finding the, um, thank you so much. <laughs> Finding the um, Tiger Stripe surfboard that is on display just behind that wall. And of course, <coughs> that was kind of a signature of the big surfboards label at that time in history. <coughs> I'd like to bring uh, Tom up to talk about how he found that surfboard.
how much did it cost? What's the most valuable for it? Uh, are you still married? <laughs>
Uh, I can't remember what it was, but, but she wasn't happy that all this is going on, surfboards and, and this. So I, I, I'm thinking, well, let, let's, let's see what happens here, you know? And I said, you know, I said, hey, I'm uh, Tom. Uh, Boy, I sure, I sure love your husband's surfboards. And I see he's got quite a few in there. I said, I bet you've heard all the stories. You know, oh, I got this one for half price, or I got this one in a trade, or this one was in a dumpster somewhere. Um, these are great investments. Yeah, you know, I bet you've heard of all these stories. And she turns at him, just, you know, looks at me and just, I can just see her, you know, blowing up. And she looks at him and explodes. You know, we have no groceries, and you know, we can't afford the cash, we spend all our money on these damn surfboards. And she just goes, and she gets wound up, going more and more, louder and louder. She's screaming at him. I'm 15 feet up in the air watching all this happen, and he's just shrinking like this. And she's screaming, and I'm sure the neighbor's going to start coming out, the police will be coming. I, I thought she was going to kill him. And so I, I shout down uh, to this guy, and I don't know, Jack, whatever his name is. Jack, can I, can I buy your board from you? Would that help? And he, and he goes, well, how much are you giving me for it? I said, I'll give you whatever you pay for it. And he goes, it was, it was three grand. I wonder what that would cost. I said, that's fine. I said, three grand. So I come down and, and I go to my car quickly and I write out this check and she's still standing there and, and uh, I pick up the surfboard, I got my pictures, pick up the surfboard, I jump in the car I, and I just came away and go, Yahoo, what a great board. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's one of the, the every board, they all have great stories. Uh, uh, we're lucky to have that one in the book. It's, it's sure a beauty. I hope you've seen it. Enjoy the board. Well, thank you. That's a great story. And um, I have to thank Tom Moss. Without Tom and his contribution, his collection, his wonderful photography, the book would not have been the same at all. And. Um, there, you know, there are so many great stories that came out of this, so many great people contributed, in fact. Um, because the, the thing Serpo's book was a labor of, uh, in many ways a labor of love and a collaboration. Uh, Bing, myself, uh, Tom Moss, Terry Krajewski, who was the initiator of the book, you know, and a whole bunch of other people actually contributed in so many ways, including financially, to make it happen. And, uh, you know, it's actually been probably more successful than any of us could have imagined. It's now in its second printing, for example, which is pretty extraordinary for a surfboard book. Uh, but most of them get remainder and uh, you know left in warehouses. But this one has gone on uh, to be very successful, not least because being surfboards are still being made. And in that, there's another story because um, a young man by the name of Matt Calvani took over the being surfboard label, and I'm going to bring Matt up. He's going to talk a little bit about that story. Since 2000, now when I took it over, and 
and honestly, like the partnership between Bing and I has been something special. It's like uh, he's a special person, and he was an amazing board builder and has a legacy that you know it just goes on and on. And that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted to be part of. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much pretty much why I make Bing surfboards today. <laughs> 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 I had other choices, but um, but I went with Bing. So. And I also want to thank my wife because if it wasn't for her, she wouldn't we wouldn't have everything like <laughs> bills and even resin or anything like that. So. <laughs> and now we have a retail store uh, in uh, in uh, Acadia, and uh, and I want to thank Royce Cancel for that. He's over here, and um, he's instrumental in making that happen. And, He's taking on the license for Bing Apparel, and so we're making we're selling Bing boards. The great thing about the store is that it's like a surf shop. I mean, it's like it's like 50 percent or more surfboards. It's like you walk in there and you go, "Wow, this is like like what surf shops should be like." You know, I mean, we gotta make money, but uh, it's really a special thing, and I'm enjoying it. And it's a great place to just like. Go in there and you know you see all the boards and people come in there and they want to talk about boards and there's people that are educated and know about the models and it's a good thing it's not all about clothing you know that's that's also necessary but you know some shops you go in and you go is this a surf shop like right? where's the boards you know so it's kind of cool um, let's see uh, my forgetting somebody oh Chris Del Moro uh, I gotta thank you because uh, he's super instrumental in the brand. And, We've been forming the brand for what, like six years now or something. We've been working together and with uh, new models and longboard models and shortboard models and logos. So he's really instrumental in you know branding the, the brand to go further into the future and everything. And we're going to do a lot more. Um, so so many people. I want to you know I can't remember everybody that I want to thank you know, but that's pretty much. I want to thank everybody for being part of the brand. And uh, thanks for coming. Enjoy. One of the things Matt didn't say is that you know he made a specialty of uh, bringing back some of the classic uh, Bing models from the late '60s and the early '70s, the transition era, which he at first faithfully reproduced as they were. You know, down to the glass jobs, which are exceptional, uh, the shape jobs, which are fantastic, the guys are fantastic shaper. And, you know, they've also taken the big circles into the modern era. Uh, one of the stories he didn't tell, that I think is worth telling a little bit, is that the way he got into this, he was shaped in the South Bay, and he was working with uh, the son of uh, Bing's former partner, uh, Rick Stoner. And because of that, they've been making Rick surfboards and Bing surfboards, and he happened to meet up with Bing in person down in Mexico one time, and, and, and so he said, oh, shit, I'm going to go talk to the guy. And he said, Bing, I owe you money for royalties. And Bing said, what? He said, well, I've been making surfboards with your lame woman. <laughs> so, can we make an arrangement? <laughs> And so Bing said, sure, no problem. Bing Steele work. Bing was impressed with Matt's work. The rest is, as they say, history. I'd like to bring up now the man that made it all possible from the get-go, Bing Copeland. I'm not going to tell you the whole story 
strength of my life because it's in the book. Uh, and, and Paul tells me better than I can tell. So I'll tell you a couple of things that I feel real fortunate about. <clears throat> and the uh, major first one is I'm, I'm feel real fortunate that I grew up in the era that I It was right after the Second World War, it was in the late 40s. Um, 48 and 49 is when I started hanging on the rail of the Manhattan Beach Pier watching the older guys surf the you know, big heavy balls of the those planks and the white of the cookbox boards. And <clears throat> as I was standing there one day, this scrawny little skinny kid came up and stand and stood next to me and we were both watching the waves and, and we got to talking and we introduced ourselves to each other and turns out it was Greg Noel. And uh, he smelled a little bit like anything <coughs> because at the time he was the big boy on the end of the pier. <laughs> <laughs> but we watched the older guys serve and we were really, it was really intriguing to us. And the boards were like, you know, close to 100 pounds, 90 to 100 pounds. And, and you have to remember this is before I hope you were building commercial boards or Belzee was building commercial boards. There really wasn't any. I mean, there were specific poems made planks. Uh, eventually, Rock Simmons uh, started making some boards. But at that time, uh, Bill Belzee was the lifeguard on the pier. And one day, uh, he came up to Greg and I and he said, uh, I'm just going to try to work. I have a little board down on the beach there. And so we said, yeah, we went down, and it was about eight foot long board, weighed about 80 pounds, we had to drag it through the sand. <clears throat> and we took it out, and after curling uh, too many times, we finally caught a wave that, uh, and rode to the beach and stood up, and that was the moment that I knew that I would have wanted to be the surf. <clears throat> uh, it wasn't long after that, I, uh, we all, Belsey included, uh, started riding Simmons boards. And to go to Santa Monica to sit in the shop and buy a board was uh, for a whole other story. <laughs> I mean, it was, he, he built maybe three or four boards a week at the most, and uh, he only built them, he would build them for people he liked. He was a little different. <clears throat> uh, at the time he built my first board, he had Joe Quigg and Matt Kidlin were, were doing the fiberglass and form. This was the first fiberglass board actually in existence. They were the Hollywood top and bottom, styrofoam in the middle, the first composite to the boards were. <clears throat> and I remember, I was at 14, I had a 10 foot long, 24 inch wide Simmons board that I could, I could stand up on and not get my feet wet. And I was almost like a stand up elevator in front of me at that time. And, uh, I, it, I've been around resin and fiberglass all my life, but I still can smell that first board, the sweet smell of that resin. I, it's, it's in my brain. So I just, I'll never forget it. <clears throat> we, uh, we brought those boards for a couple of years, and we would surf, you know, this will blow some young minds, we would go surfing with the older guys. That's the only way we could go. It was obviously years away from being able to drive, so. Whenever we could wheel them into uh, taking a uh, surf trip, we got to go. We got to go to Malibu, Rincon, Huntington, uh, San Onofre, uh, Wind and Sea, all these different places. This is when we were uh, 13, 14 years old. And we could go to any of those places and surf with three or four guys anytime. We can, anytime. And there's no crowds. There's none. In fact, I would say that Greg and I, if we weren't the only two, we were two of only a handful of surfers our age on the whole West Coast. I mean, they just weren't in, in those days. So that was that's special to me that I lived through that era. Um, when I graduated from high school in 1954, uh, a bunch of us took the lifeguard test, which is the next easiest job in the world. <laughs> and, uh, so we lifeguarded for the next two summers, and we'd always heard from the older guys that had made trips to Hawaii about how great Hawaii was. So we knew we wanted to go to Hawaii. So six of us uh, in 1955, after lifeguarding for the summer and fall, we went to <coughs> went to Hawaii. 
started in Waikiki, ran to the place, and for a week or 10 days, we surfed Waikiki, picked him, just us, nobody around. We could surf four times a day, and it would never be crowded. Um, and we're on Belsey Boards by this time, Belsey Boards are And uh, as luck would have it, during those days, uh, it, we, the, our country had a draft system, and we didn't want to be in the army. So when we were in high school, we joined the Rick Pick Store and I joined the Coast Guard. We <coughs> went to meetings and this and that. And when, uh, when we ran out, so we ran out of money, at the end of 1955, we enlisted into the Coast Guard and got to stay in Hawaii for the next two years. And I'm very grateful that I got to spend my military time between wars surfing every day. <laughs>
So I entered the business and a lot of the major manufacturers went out. I chose to license my support Dr. to Larry Gordon, my good friend in San Diego. And I moved to Idaho and started another business up there that's been good to me. And uh, everything went fine for a while. I, I got into catamaran sailing and, and windsurfing and in the mid-1980s mid I, I bought some property in Baja. And uh, several years later, we discovered we could drive about 20, 20, miles, 20 minutes down the road and we could find fun surf. And so we were doing that. And it was the one day in the year 2000, I was on this deserted beach. I just got out of the water changing my trunks. <clears throat> I sort of rental car drove up with two short boards and two, two young guys. And, and uh, it turns out that was Matt Kalani. And uh, we started talking. I, I liked him right away. Uh, he said he liked to build my boards. The story is a little longer than that. It tells me. He said he liked to build my boards, and so the Mikey is okay. He was building my boards at the time. Uh, we took the, the board building back to the Muscle Beach, and Matt, <coughs> Matt, uh, for several years worked on the brand and uh, duplicated some of our models. And, and his quality was great. I was real pleased with it. One day. <coughs> Hap Jacobs, uh, who was working in the same factory, uh, introduced Margaret Yao to Matt Kalani. And Margaret was uh, Hap Jacobs' surf team worked out. And a, a romance developed. And you can see the results. <laughs>